I had a feeling somebody's missing, but maybe not. All right. So, go back here. All right. So, here's the cryptographic attacks. Now, that was sort of the blue team stuff, which tends to be sort of dull, and the attacks are, of course, exciting. So, brute force attack is the simplest attack where you just try every possible key. And um, if your key is too short, this will work. And this is why 40-bit encryption is garbage and 56-bit encryption is garbage, because 2 to the 40 is not an undoable number of calculations. And since 2000, 2 to the 56 is not an undoable amount of calculations. 2 to the 128 is an undoable amount of calculations, so you cannot brute force AES. But you can totally brute force DES, or the content scrambling system used for DVDs, which uses a 40-bit key. So your key has to be longer than about 80 bits, around 100, or in principle, it can be brute forced. Social engineering is the most powerful attack. It always has been conning people, just trick them into telling you their secrets. This is fantastically powerful um, and not uh, mathematical at all. Rainbow tables is a time memory trade-off attack. For certain encryption schemes like Microsoft um, password hashes before Windows Vista, they used an older algorithm called LM hashes that they got from IBM. And this had a key space that wasn't that large. So you could pre-calculate a bunch of the hashes and then you could put them in a RAM table and look them up in RAM instead of calculating them. And that meant that a computer at the time, the days of Windows XP in about 15 minutes could try every possible password until it found the one because they made the calculation faster by pre-calculating part of it and using RAM to substitute for time. Um, this is not very effective on modern NTLM hashes or Linux hashes or anything. It only works if your hash table is small enough to fit in the amount of RAM you can afford to buy. So it was pretty powerful back in the days of Windows XP. Now it's not currently that much of a benefit for modern hashes. Known plain text is a big problem. If you can guess what the plain text is, then you can often get a huge jump forward at cracking it. Now, this is one of the many problems at web. Since you're encrypting network traffic, Network traffic is incredibly predictable. Most network traffic is ARP packets, and ARP packets are all the same. All right, where is 192.168.11? Tell 192.168.1101. Almost every bit of that is the same every time. It's the smallest packet on the wire. It's the most common packet on the wire. You can very easily identify them, even if it's encrypted, and you know most of the bits in it. So you are not presented with the problem for which cryptographic algorithms were designed, where Adam encrypts a secret and sends it to Bob, Alice sends it to Bob, and Eve only sees the ciphertext, you actually have a pretty good guess what the plain text was too, so now you have a pretty good chance of figuring out the key, and that's one of the many flaws in web. Um, so there's even chosen plain text attacks. This is what a whole bunch of attacks against HTTPS were. If I can feed it plain text and it will encrypt it and send me back the ciphertext, then I can carefully feed it carefully chosen plain text that will reveal secrets about the key. And there's a whole series of these, beast, crime, and other attacks. And these are padding oracle attacks. The problem is, if you have to pad the last block with something, and I know what you padded it with, now I know something about the plain text. So it, it's like that um, ARP packet attack. I now know not only the ciphertext, I know some of the plain text too. And therefore, that means I'm going to be more likely to find exploitable weaknesses. And there are a whole series of HTTPS weaknesses, attacks based on that. And the cure for that was to get rid of RC4. RC4 turned out to be the problem. And they pretty much eliminated RC4 about a year ago because it carries a whole series of these attacks where if you can do billions of calculations on the HTTPS server and compare them all, you can do something about the key. The meet in the middle attack I explained, if you want to crack something with two rounds of DES, you run DES forward from this and backward from that and make a match in the middle. And now you have made the problem into two problems that are only square root of complexity. So instead of having to break 112 bits key, you just have to break two separate 56 bit keys. And that is much easier. That's why two DES is not a thing. Two DES is not any better than one DES. It has to be three DES to be as strong as two DES keys. Anyway, um, there's known key. If you have some knowledge about the key, of course, that's fine. You might, the key might be based on a dictionary word or somehow you otherwise have some information about the key. And then there's differential cryptanalysis, which is an extremely powerful technique. It was a military secret of the NSA for about 20 years or so people believe. And uh, they, they, 
the reason they believe this is because there are features of SHA-1, which the NSA approved, which were designed to resist this attack, which was not known outside the classified community at that time. So in that case, they used their advanced secret information to our benefit. But in other cases, they used it to give us some crap and lie to us about it. It's, it's a problem. This is, the unclassified community is justifiably nervous about these people that have secret information that do stuff and you don't know why. They're, it makes you nervous, but that's where it is. Side channel attacks are the main one, something like the power consumption or the radio or the timing leaking out data. Um, and there's implementation attacks where you, they make some kind of mistake in the hardware, like they leave the key in RAM. And so you can freeze the RAM like that video and get it. That's not a mathematical problem. The key might be plenty long enough, but you left the key somewhere where it could be stolen. Then your math is all shot. Um, the birthday attack shows the how strong hash functions are. If you have a real classroom with 23 students and you ask them for their birthday, just month and day, you might think, they will not, two of them will not have the same birthday because there's 365 birthdays, but this is not, and if you were to choose a day like January 1 and see if someone has it, that's what would happen. You need to have about 180 students before somebody would have it. But if you're just looking for two of them to be the same, it's not a question of how many students there are, it's a question of how many pairs of students there are. I might match you and I might match her and you might match her. So if you have 23 students, there are 23 times 22 over two pairs, and that's more than 180. So there's more than a 50% chance that two of them have the same birthday in a room of 23 people. And this means if I'm trying to crack a hash function like SHA-1 that's 160 bits, if I just start hashing random files, I do not have to hash two to the 160 files to find a collision. I have to hash two to the 80 files before I'll find a collision. It's the square root. So the hash function has to be twice as long as the largest number of processes you can ever do, which is why 128 MD5 is not long enough 160 was not long enough, and hash functions are now 256 or longer. <coughs> so that even half of that is still too long. That's what you need. Anyway, um, so implementing cryptography, here's the way you use it. We talked about this before. Digital signature is the part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is, so if you want to sign something, you have a message here, and the message is not secret. You're not going to encrypt it. You're just going to sign it. So you take the message, you hash it with SHA-1 or something, and then you encrypt this with your private key. That is the signature. Now your public key is well known, anybody can find it. So anybody that wants to can verify this. They take your public key, they decrypt this and get a hash, then they hash this method, and if those hashes match, that proves that you signed it and that it has not been altered. So now you can sign something like a loan agreement or something, and it can hold up in court because you can mathematically prove who signed it, and that nobody altered it after that. That's the digital signature standard. Yeah. What's that? So it can prove authentication, and it can prove that the data was not stored. That's right. And it can prove who you are, but it cannot prove there's no confidentiality. So yes, by, this does not have confidentiality. This is a signature scheme. Now, you could encrypt it for confidentiality, but that's a different process. This, the only purpose of this is to sign it so that you have non-repudiation, so you can do financial transactions over the internet. But yes, this by, you could then encrypt this whole thing with AES or ISA or something if you wanted confidentiality. Um, and that's why there are, if you get PGP, there are encrypted emails and there are signed emails and there are emails that are both signed and encrypted and you can do any of these options. And for example, there's um, downloads. There's signed downloads, like you download a Microsoft update, it's signed. It's not encrypted because it's not a secret, but it's signed so you can verify that it is from Microsoft and it hasn't been altered. Nobody put a virus in it. So that's a case where you don't need privacy, but you need authenticity, and you get that with this kind of signature. So that's how you verify the signature. You take the signature and you, you hash the message and you decrypt this with the public key, and if those two things match, then you know that who sent it, and you know that it has not been altered. There's a message authentication code, which is very similar. This protects integrity and authenticity, and they often use a shared secret as well. This is very commonly used in financial transactions, and there's various versions of it using different kinds of encryption and hashing routines. <coughs> These are just ways to put a fingerprint on something so you can be sure at the other end 
that it hasn't been altered and that you know who sent it. HMAC is another one, um, a shared secret and hashing algorithm. And there's a public key infrastructure. Since you have to look up these public keys, there is a system of servers just to distribute them. Just like there's a DNS system to distribute domain names and IP addresses, there's a public key system, the PKI, of certificate authorities that are encoded in your browser and run servers on the internet so you can get everybody's public keys when you need them. Um, so that's the game. You can have your own digital certificate in principle and have mutual authentication where not only does Google prove who they are with a key, you also do. In normal browsing, your browser creates a random private, private key pair every time you make a connection and it uses it only for that connection and then throws it away. So it provides encryption, but it doesn't persist. You could also purchase a certificate and have your own certificate and then identify yourself on the internet. And this was considered cost prohibitive back when certificates cost $1,000 a year, but now they're free. So this may become a thing. People aren't doing it yet. <coughs> but you could have mutual authentication where I, my machine is verified to be known and the server is verified to be known. That would be more secure, of course. It would also be more annoying because you have to somehow carry this key around. And if you get a different laptop, it wouldn't be there and all that jazz. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's encrypt. Let's encrypt is the free source of certificates. And I thought they would vanish and go broke, but that did not happen. I don't know how they're getting the money, but it's working very well. They're now the number one CA. Everyone just gets free certificates and they seem to be just fine. So it has really, you know, disrupted the certificate marketplace. Used to be you could charge hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for a certificate. And now not very many people are willing to pay for them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah. Okay. So if I went in on users CPC mod, yeah. Using a hashing and a shared secret key, am I getting an encrypted message or I'm getting a hash? Uh, this message authentication code does not encrypt the message. It is just a fingerprint. Button. It's just a signature. Of sorts. That's all it is. Yeah. You could add encryption, but by itself, the only purpose of this is to verify the authenticity and integrity of the message. Okay, so it's yeah. only Yeah, that's right. And you often use an encryption scheme to create this value, but it's not necessarily encrypting the message. Good. Good. All right, so the public key infrastructure has got certificate authorities that run servers and they issue the certificate. So if you want to make a secure website, you have to get a certificate from the certificate authority. It used to be you had to pay them a pile of money and you send a certificate request to them and they send you the, prob the private key. Um, I think somehow encrypted so it doesn't get lost in transit. I, the certificate signing request. Oh, you send them your public key. You generate a private and public key. You send them the public key with a certificate signing request and they sign your public key. So your private key never leaves your system and it doesn't come from them. Now, they never know your private key at all. That's the point, that's why it's safe. You send them your public key, they sign it and bless it. And that means whenever anybody else uses that public key, the certificate authority will verify that it really came from you. Because there's an attack on this system, I can publish a fake key for Google. And if somebody uses that, I can read it. And so the question is, how do you know you got the right public key? So you need someone to, to testify whose public key that is, and that's what certificate authorities do. They close the identity gap. And that's the point. So instead of, everybody could make their own certificates, and those would be self-signed, but there's no way to tell if they're genuine. They could be from an attacker impersonating someone. That's what the certificate authorities are supposed to provide, is confidence that the key you're using really came from the name it claims to have come from. And that would work as long as these people never get bribed or hacked or sell their private keys. All these things have totally happened, however. They've been pressured by government into handing them out. They have been selling them to the highest bidder because one thing companies have, companies want to man in the middle of the HTTPS. People go to like Dropbox and they upload stuff with HTTPS and your company wants to know if you're sending company secrets up there or if you're downloading viruses from it. So they want to know what's in your HTTPS traffic. So they just man in the middle of it with fake root certificates, which they can just buy from the certificate authorities. And it's been an open secret that you can just buy, any big company can just buy a fake root certificate from these certificate authorities and impersonate them for this purpose at any time. And so can law enforcement. 
And this was a open secret, like the Chinese hacking everybody, until about four years ago when Trustwave made a public announcement that they were no longer going to sell fake root certificates. And the Mozilla community freaked out and said, why are you taking Trustwave out? Those rotten bums, they've been selling certificates. They've been violating our whole trust model. They said, read my lips. We are not going to do it anymore. Everybody else is still doing it. Don't take us out, kick all of them out. And then they were screaming and yelling, but it is an open secret that the trust model is based on these guys never selling your certificates, and that is a lie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was one of the early attacks. Someone social engineered and bought a couple of Microsoft certificates, but this is a bigger industry issue. You supposedly have a list of 100 trusted companies in your browser, and you can trust them and nobody else. And in fact, they sell it to people with money. So people that want to man in the middle of your stuff can just buy a certificate from them and, no, and, they'll, and then pretend to be them when they aren't. And so your HTTPS security is a lot less than you think it is. Really, you're just trusting anybody rich, rich enough to buy the certificate. Yeah, I'm thinking that one thing is Google Chrome's failure, which is when it finds fake certificates, it reports them back. And so Google gets a lot of reports about fake certificates. Well, sure, Google Chrome has a lot of advanced security features, but not this one, because this certificate is not fake. Yeah. You'll have a TrustWave certificate that really uses a TrustWave private key. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, TrustWave isn't selling their private key to people and not telling you. It's That's the problem. You, you can't, you, math does not mean that you get out of actually having to trust a human who could stab you in the back. There's no way, that's the Bitcoin people think, we'll have a blockchain, now we don't need to trust anybody. And unfortunately, you just can't get away from the fact that you have to trust somebody, and if they betray you, you're screwed, and no amount of math can stop that. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. People come to Bob.com, and somebody goes to Trustway or whoever. Yeah. Yes, that is exactly what happens. At your, if you go to a corporation and you go to Bob.com on that website, you send a request for Bob.com certificate and the corporate firewall sends you a fake certificate with the wrong public key claiming to be Bob.com. And they claim, and when you send a request to the third party to verify it, they have the ability to forge the response because they have the private key they're not supposed to have. So they give your browser, if you were to go to work and go to bob.com and write down the certificate public key and then go home and go to bob.com, you'd find a different key. And that is exactly what is never supposed to happen. Because but if you couldn't do that, no corporation would be safe. They would end HTTPS. Because they're right. They have to know what you're doing. If you send something horrible like death threats and racist stuff over the internet, they're liable for that legally. They're supposed to not let you use corporate email to do that horrible stuff. So they have to scan it legally. They can't let you have an encrypted tunnel out of their company. They have to man in the middle of it. Yeah, well, not all companies, but all big companies. Essentially, because they also have to know if malware is coming through. They have legitimate reasons to monitor the traffic, and they have every legal right to because it's company machines. But the technical way to do it is messing up the security model of the internet. Yeah. yeah that's how they do it at the other years. You have to go to a website to download certificates because if they're mailing the machines, they're Yes, that is the honest way to do it. They could have their own CA and they could tell you to install this extra CA in your browser. And that would be okay, and they could do that without you even noticing because they put it on the company machines. But if you bring in your laptop from home, you won't be able to surf the internet until you put on the official company certificate. That's the way to do it without providing the trust model of the internet. But in fact, companies are doing it the other way, and law enforcement is totally doing it the other way. One of the big things that came out about this was the Suits and Spooch conference. Now, I don't know how this can even exist, but there's a guy that made a conference where um, non-military security experts go to a conference to meet with spies and talk about techniques and stuff. And vendors go there, and the vendors sell HTTPS intercepting firewalls. And it says, this is the firewall, plug in the root key here on a USB stick, and it will totally let you see all the HTTPS traffic. They sell these things, and they don't tell you how to get that root key. Uh, it's like you can go to a special store in San Francisco and get this funny looking pipe, They'll say, oh, I can't talk about how you get what goes in that pipe, but you can have the pipe. Yeah. 
or like when iPods came out, you could play this music and it's awesome, except there's no legal way to get the music. So you won't talk about where the music came from. Once you've got it, you can play the music. So it became obvious that there is a back door to buy these root certificates that you're not supposed to have. And law enforcement gets them and corporations get them. And therefore, a bunch of people are very, very upset and say this system is not as secure as it should be and you need a better one. But that's not on the horizon. There have been proposals for alternative systems, but they haven't gotten anywhere. This one is good enough for most purposes. And nobody is that interested in modifying it, but it is very far from as beautiful as the designers thought it was going to be. And the fundamental problem is there are real criminals and there are real cops and there are real spies and there are reasons why people want to look at what you're doing. And they find ways to stick in back doors here and there. And it's very hard to convince all the stakeholders that they really don't need that back door. A bunch of people like your corporate security officers and your legal team and the FBI and the NSA are really convinced that they need to see that stuff. And they really want to put a back door in it of some kind. And they are doing so. And it's very hard to imagine any way you could really stop them. Yeah. Yes, I think that would be another very honest way. Just say you could buy, your computer will be cheaper if you get the, the yeah, well, you'd market it as the, the home version or something like that, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, good enough for normal people. Unless you're some kind of terrorist or something, it's good enough for you. Uh, anyway, so that's what we're really using. The government is spying on everything in, in Britain, the public all know this and accept it. In America, the public demand to be lied to and say, oh, no, no, just pretend it's not happening. Um, I've heard romance songs about this. They say, tell me lies, tell me lies. I want you to lie to me. I've never quite understood this. I was married at one time. One, toward the end of my marriage, my ex-wife screamed at me. She said, if you'd loved me, you would have at least lied to me. And I was sort of baffled. But there is a real psychology thing here, especially in America, where people want to pretend things are not happening. Like we want to pretend that all our presidents go to church and are faithful to their wives. Like people think Donald Trump doesn't have a parade of women he's having sex with. He runs beauty contests and gambling halls. And we pretend that's true when everyone knows it's not true. My European friends wonder what our problem is. But Americans have some weird desire, like from Britain, to keep up appearances and pretend things that we all know are false. It's a weird cultural issue. Anyway, so key management is an issue. You have to keep your private key. You have to not lose it. If you were to lose your private key, all the people encrypting stuff, you couldn't read it anymore. So you have to back it up. Now, you probably don't want to give your backup provider a copy of the key. So you might use key escrow. Or you might break the key into pieces and only give a part to different places. So none of them have the whole key. There are various ways to do it. By the way, Microsoft software has a technique to send the key to the government. There have been several strong government proposals demanding that you have to send every private key to the government. And it got so far through Congress that Microsoft built the technology in the operating system to be able to do that. It never got approved yet. But there have been multiple government proposals that every private key needs to go to the government so they can snoop on it. And Microsoft is just here to make money. You say, yeah, whatever you want, we'll do it. They got no problem. Just tell us what it is. And they have the technology to do that, but it hasn't been turned on yet. Yeah, you got a question back there? Okay, good. Okay, anyway. So, all right, so SSL was the early system designed by Netscape, and it turned out, it became obsolete and insecure. There was version two and version three. They're both hopelessly broken. Now, TLS is the only one anybody uses anymore. Um, we saw the SSL handshake earlier. You have SIM, SENAC, ACT, make a TCP connection, then the client says what it can do, then the server picks one of them and says, let's do that. Then you uh, send, you send uh, certificate that comes down, then your browser connects the certificate authority to make sure it's really from the right company, and after all that, now you're ready to go. Now you have an encrypted, secure channel from you to that server. Yeah. Yeah. It would be as if the man of them download a file, hash it, and then check the hash. Essentially the same thing is going on here. No, this is more. Checking the hash is what happens if you get like a, a, um, a file from BitTorrent. You get a block, it has a hash. The problem is I could make a fake file with a fake hash and you'd still believe it. I could make my fake hash match my fake file. So the fact that the hash matches isn't enough to know that it's authentic. So you have to somehow verify it with a trusted third party and that's the certificate authority. 
So you get this thing and it says, I am uh, the key for Google and I'm the key for Google because Komodo said so. And you then send it up to Komodo and say, Komodo, is this really the right key for Google? And they say, yes, it is. Now you believe it's Google. So I, nobody can fool you unless they hack two companies. They'd have to hack Google and Komodo. Does, does Google sign its own certificate? And so Google has its own certificate authority. Yeah. So they're so trusted. That's right. Yeah. But the, the trusted certificate authorities are built in your browser by the browser maker. So there is a group of 100 companies that have been chosen arbitrarily to be trusted. And by the way, there is no auditing. No regulations. There's no process to add them. And Mozilla, by the way, about five years ago, they found like 10 certificate authorities at Weird Town Engage, and they said, who are these people? We don't know who they are. They don't seem to be real companies. They've been here for like 10 years. We can't figure out who put them in there. We can't reach the company. What are they doing in here? You know, there's no licensing. There's no government inspection. It's That itself is another weak spot. It's just whoever the browser manufacturer chose to put in there in the trusted list. Yeah. There are alternative systems and they're really terrible. The one of them is the web of trust where you go to parties and you sign people's keys because you know that person. And then you get a friend of a friend that signed the key. That's the, that's the original hippie model. And I said, and so you trust them because someone vouched for them and someone vouched for them. And they're only like three friends of a friend away. So I guess that's all right. And you actually rate in your, you actually grade in your system, you see how, how far down the friends of friends do you want to trust them? I'll only trust people two links away or three links away. That's the alternative system. And that is clearly not very practical. Yeah. Isn't that how the DNS root servers do it? The DNS root servers do, here's the DNS root servers are the other way. DNSSEC is an alternative system that could replace this. And DNSSEC works like this. You trust your DNS server because it's signed by the one above it. You trust it by the one, ultimately there's dot at the top of the tree. The reason you trust Dot is because they chose eight celebrities that are trusted by the internet at large, and one of them is Dan Kaminsky, and they are the trusted holders of the DNS root key, and they have to meet every year in a ceremony and bring in their thumb drive, like a holy ritual, and plug it in and add up the eight pieces and make sure that the DNS root key is still right. That's how they do it. So <laughs> that, it sounds insane, but I mean... This is the problem. You have to trust somebody. So do you trust your government or do you just trust rich people or do you trust celebrities or, or do you trust your friends? You have to trust somebody. And of course that only goes so far. And so you've just got a problem. It, it's ridiculous. But you know, this is, this is like a little kid could ask this, daddy, how do I know I can trust somebody? And I said, you know, kid, that's a really good question. <laughs> you really need to. You can't go through life without trusting somebody, but whoever they are, you can't really trust them too far. Yep. And that's one of the hard things about life. There's just a lot of risk. Your risk will never get to zero. All the math in the world will not get your risk to zero. You're trusting somebody. Yeah. Or if you don't use the web browser, you just use the, uh, the type one encryptors on each side to encrypt along, encrypt along the wire. Yeah. Well, there's, there's that, but then there's going to be a key at both ends of the wire. And how did that key get there? And how do you know that's the right key? That's why, you know, the math is good in a nice, simple situation where you have Alice and Eve and Bob, but in the real world, how do you know that's really Bob and how do you know where that wire really goes? And <laughs> that's the problem. I mean, when telephones came out, the people I knew were really nervous. Wait a minute. I don't know who I'm talking to. How do I know that's really you on the other end of that telephone? And, you know, again, that's something I laughed off at the time. And I said, you know, now that you mention it, that is a real, especially with voice over IP and deep fakes, that is not a stupid question at all. How do I know who I'm really talking to? Especially now with chat rooms and everything. That's, this is exactly on target. Yeah. So, the third one, so the place or the web, some people go to GoDaddy to get their certificates. Yeah. Is, there, is GoDaddy then the certificate? I think they are. I think GoDaddy is a root, but if not, they have a deal with the root. I mean, they sell a certificate. They're either, I think they're already reselling for somebody else, but they might be a trusted root. So you <laughs> You have your key. You have a private key you never tell anybody. You send your public key to them, and they sign it and store it. And then when other people come, they send the public key and say, is this the right public key for these guys? Who answers that question? GoDaddy or? The, well, GoDaddy might answer it. If GoDaddy answers it, it might be. Oh, you know, here's actually another fun. I'm glad you brought this up. This is another hilarious scandal. So let's take a look at this, and we might as well use GoDaddy. 
let's go to GoDaddy. Um, that's right. And no matter what you do, that's why at DEF CON, whenever you have something, you say, okay, you have a security product, what's the, what's the attack? And if you have an attack, what's the defense? There's nothing ever perfect. So let's go to GoDaddy. Tor is a U.S. military project. You're sending your data to the government. The, the, every every five years, the hippies suddenly discover again that Tor is sending all the data to the government, and they freak out, and then they start using it again to download their porn. It's it's hilarious to watch. There's this illusion. There's this illusion that you're hiding your data from the government in America, which makes no sense at all. But people want to believe it, so they will just keep on believing it, no matter how many times they realize it's not true. So if I go to GoDaddy, if I can only spell it right. Okay, here's GoDaddy. So I don't even, oh, here it is. Okay, so if I go to GoDaddy and I look at the certificate, okay, there's a, here's, the reason why I believe this is GoDaddy is because the GoDaddy Secure Certificate Authority said it was, but this is not trusted by my browser. The one that's trusted is the Root Certificate Authority. So when I verify it, I ask these guys, and they tell me it's GoDaddy. Then my browser has to make another query asking these guys, is that really the guys I should trust? That it is, in fact, the same company, but it's a different server, and they have a different role. Now, for other websites that aren't that important, like let's do mine, where I'm, not, I'm certainly not a CA. Let's do samsclass.info. Here we should find a different chain. Okay. Um, Certificates, okay, signed by Cloudflare, and Cloudflare is not a trusted authority, so the reason you might believe them is this Cloudflare intermediate authority is signed by this one, and the reason you trust that one is they're assigned by this one, and that one is trusted, it has a different logo. This one's built into the browser. So this is what you're supposed to do. I ask this one, is this really the certificate? And then I ask that one, is this really who they say they are? And then I ask that one, is this really who they say they are? And all those people have to say yes, and only then do I have a connection. Now, Internet Explorer version three or four did not do this. It would just ask the first one and not bother asking the others. And this went on for years before somebody noticed. There was a social engineering contest. Um, they had these uh, hacking contests. It was a pretty good one. They had these... Um, they had these little keys, these heavy metal keys everybody had, and every team had it, and your goal was to get the most keys. You have to somehow get the other people to give you their keys. So one team, they got a printer, and they printed these official warning logos, and they said, the, the Department of Homeland Security has determined that there's radioactive material in those keys, and they're poisoned, and we're going to have special officers with like special coats and secure bucket to put them in and we're collecting them all and they got people dressed up and they got these impressive looking radioactive buckets and they had a phone number and when you called the phone number they had a friend saying yes this is the department of homeland security you really need to give that guy your key and they won and that's the same thing you get somebody to lie and if you don't check the authority above them you don't know and this is pretty common another thing people do is write resumes and claim to have jobs they don't have but that phone number is their buddy and when you call, he'll say, oh, yeah, they worked here. And so that, that worked for IE4. It's incredible how many mistakes have been made in this process. And most, and if you use a phone, something like 15% of Android apps and something like 5% of iPhone apps don't verify the certificate at all. They don't even ask the first one. They just use it and don't bother to verify it in the least. You can totally give them a bogus certificate and they will totally fall for it because the end user doesn't know and there is obviously no security audit at any stage in the process. So I say, when I started doing Android apps, it's like going a time machine back to 1993 when people didn't know anything. Just incredible stupidity happens. And in that regard, I think I'm gonna show you guys something which is good, clean fun, uh, which I don't, th I don't think I showed you the University of Houston yet, did I? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, so this is the certificate for my website. That's right. So here's the details. It's a uh, electric curve signature, electric curve public key, and someplace here's all the websites that are sharing it. And someplace down here is the signature algorithm, and someplace down here is the key. It's someplace around here, the public key, log key ID. Oh. Which 
Yeah, that must be a different website. It must not be samsclass.info. Well, let me take a look. We should have the same one. That's because you're using uh, Firefox, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, I guess Firefox and Chrome are going different. You know, they might be going to different routes in principle, or they might just be displaying the information differently, which I think is more likely. It's a good. It's a good question. I had trouble with Firefox. Um, just looking at the raw certificate in Wireshark would please me better. These GUIs kind of hide stuff. Anyway, um, let me show you something. We're right on target for it, so I think I'll do this. Uh, I wanted to show you this one. This is pretty amazing. Here's the University of Houston. Okay, so I test a lot of Android apps, and I test college apps. And here's what I found when I tested the University of Houston. And I never published this publicly um, for reasons you'll see. Okay, so I tested the University of Houston Android app. They had an app for alumni. Now, as you guys know about colleges, alumni are the most important people. Football is the most important activity at colleges, and alumni are the most important people because their donations fund the college. Teachers and students are all expendable. It's the alumni that keep things going. So they made a special app for the alumni. You really want to be nice to the alumni. They are far more important than the students or teachers or any of those minor people. Far harder to replace. So they gave an alumni app, and you can just search for your name here. And when you do, it shows you all these names that are like yours and what this information about them. And my first thought is this is like a privacy violation. I'm seeing all these people and I haven't logged in as them yet or anything, but it's probably not too bad. There's probably a phone directory or something. So this is not too bad yet. So then I search for something and I try to log in. And when I try to log in, I'm able to man in the middle with burp and I can see the traffic. Now this is burp in the middle, which means it's falling for the man in the middle attack. This is failure to authenticate the certificate. I was able to intercept the traffic, send it a fake key, which is what Burp does, and it accepted it and sent the traffic with the wrong encryption key so I can view the traffic here. And here is the first flaw, which is a little bit subtle, but fatal. This is sending the name, first name and last name to the server. And what it sent is um, substring of first name and substring of last last name. It did not, now when you log in, it should send your name and password to the server as data. And on the server, there should be code that uses it. But I sent it a line of code from the app. I could change these commands to other commands. This is command injection. I could execute arbitrary commands on the server from the app. Yes, you should never accept a command from the end user. You just accept data from the end user, and the commands are put there by the developer. So this shows a serious security flaw, but that one's not even worth talking about. Just forget it. What's that? Oh, yeah, but, but that, well, I did, but nobody even cared about this. This is this is nothing. Let's take a look at the next one. When you do it, it sends this data to the server, and when it does, the server re I sent 426 bytes to the server, and it replied with 351 kilobytes of data. Now I'm logging in. The answer should be yes or no. How is it 351 kilobytes? The answer is it downloads the entire database onto the phone. Everybody's credit card numbers, passwords, addresses. Oh, no. So then it's the entire database of everybody on the phone, insecurely. And then when you log in, it looks it was all that on the phone. It looks what you see on the phone. So you can use it. You think everything is okay, but it's downloading a whole database onto the phone with broken HTTPS. And I said, this is mind blowing. I've read about this in textbooks, but I've never seen one in real life before. And so I said, now I'm in a problem because I know before that if you contact colleges, they will just blame you. And I said, what do I do? So I said, I don't even want to try talking to the official authorities at the college because I know what will happen. But I did is, you know, we're in the cyber defense competition. And so right now, cyber defense competition was going on. And I looked, well, we're Texas. They're in like the southeastern region. So I put on Twitter. I said, I've done this before, but I put on Twitter, I want to talk to the CEO of like a big company. And I said, I don't like doing that because that amounts to like a public disclosure of a vulnerability because there's only one thing I could possibly have to say to these people. So I said, I would like to talk to someone in the Western Regional CCDC. That's all I said, which is not, that's something I might have an innocent query, like maybe want to go visit the team or something. So somebody said, there, I can talk to you. Here, let's go to private messages. I said, do you have a contact at the University of Houston? So I want to talk to him about something. He said, well, as a matter of fact, the guy that started CCDC works at the University of Houston. I said, oh, good, because I've learned this before. You want to talk to the competition team. They will actually fix a problem without going nuts on you. 
So I contacted him and I said, hey, can I report a vulnerability to you? And he said, well, I'm not the official guy, but you can send it to me if you want. And I said, I want. I know what will happen if I go to the official guy. So I sent this to him and he passed it on to somebody. Next day, that thing was down. And um, it was down for a month. And now there's a new app, all different and beautiful. You know, it's just what should happen. No lawsuits, no public disclosure, no, no threats, no calling the college to try to get me fired and all the usual crap that will happen. If you go through the competition, I've had great success telling the competition team. We were in another competition, and one of the competition teams, one of our rivals that was beating us, I went to their website and had a vulnerability. So I told them, and they just fixed it. No nonsense. Oh, yeah, fine, I'll fix it. Because you know, competition teams understand the game. Everybody has flaws. You have to pass them. You don't freak out and try to kill the messenger. But authority figures don't get it. They just see you as some troublemaker, some scary hacker, threatening me. So it gave you the whole database so that you can just search through it on your phone. Right? Yes. Uh, or you can just read it off the insecure network traffic, man in the middle. So I now have everybody's passwords and everything. And it's been using this for years and nobody noticed. The thing is you can't see what's happening on your phone. So it's often doing appallingly horrible things because you can't tell. And apparently there is no security audit process. So anyway, I think, um, Gee, it's a 322. You probably ought to quit. Let me see if you could possibly make it to the next cahoots. Eh, well, you guys don't seem too asleep yet. Let's see if we can get to the last cahoots. All right, so IPsec is the um, new securest form of the virtual private network, and it's really complicated. In fact, Bruce Snyder said IPsec is apparently the most secure protocol, but it is so complicated I can't even finish analyzing it. He actually cracked it several of the weak ones. It is really complicated. It has a lot of weird modes that don't make any sense. It's got one mode that encrypts the whole thing and one mode that only encrypts part of the data and nobody knows why. Why would you only want to encrypt part of it? What are you nuts? Anyway, authentication, header, encapsulating, security, payload, and a key exchange protocols. It's got faster and less secure and slower, more secure modes of all this jazz. It's really quite complicated, but it is quite secure. The strongest VPNs are IPsec-based VPNs. It was a protocol designed to that was designed to work with IP version six to encrypt IP version six traffic. And it was so useful. They backboarded it to IP version four. So the EPS encrypts ESP encrypts the data. So and yeah. yeah. So um, authentication uh, pro uh, provides that it was, so I'm going back to the trial. Yeah. Authentication yeah. means that you know who sent it. Authentic. Integrity means it has not been altered. So that is integrity. No, integrity just means it has not been altered. Like you could download a file and it's not been altered, but you don't know who sent it. Authentication means you know who sent it. And that does not necessarily mean you know integrity. They're separate. And confidentiality is? Confidentiality means that unauthorized parties cannot read it. Unauthorized parties cannot read it. Which typically means other people, other than the sender and receiver. If I'm sending data to Google, it's okay that I can read it, and it's okay that Google can read it, but nobody else should be able to read it. So if I, I know, because I asked that question when you did uh, encryption further mm -hmm. up, and it said no confidentiality. Right, that was not encryption, that was a signature. Putting okay, a signature on something does not provide confidentiality. It only provides authenticity that, the date that you know who signed it, and, and it also has integrity that you know it was not altered. Right, it's not a secret. You could public post it in a public place and everybody could verify, like a deed. This is like for things like property ownership records that are public. You, you do a search. When someone's selling you a house, you do a search to see if somebody else owns the house because all the house ownership is public. For exactly this reason, I have to be able to answer the question, does somebody else own this house? And so there has to be a public record of who owns all the houses. And that has to be reliable. Those things have to be signed by people and they have to be not altered for you to be sure that you find out that nobody else owns this house. That's what it's for. Good, it's fine, no reason to hurry. We got plenty of time. Um, so, all right, uh, so you've got these different modes of this thing. The way I um, IPsec works, you make security associations, one for each direction. You have one security association one way and one security association the other way. This, by the way, is also true of TCP. The TCP handshake, SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, is actually a SYN, ACK one way and a SYN, ACK the other way. 
And to save time, they often combine the two in the middle as one packet. But it's really a one-way connection and a separate one-way connection to go the other way. That's how it's designed. Anyway, Isaac Camp is the process that's used to make these security associations, and it has a security parameter index in it, and it has two modes, one more secure than another. And so there's a tunnel mode that encrypts the entire packet, including the addressing. And there's a transport mode that encrypts the payload but preserves the address. Uh, VPNs typically work as tunnels, which means if I get a VPN in like Israel, then everybody I talk to thinks I'm in Israel. All my packets appear to come from Israel. That's a tunnel. Transport would not hide who, where I'm from. It would just hide the contents of the data. Like HTTPS is typically only transport. This is why if you're at a company, and if you're at work and you're reading your Gmail and your company doesn't want you to do that, your host, HTTPS will not save you because it does not hide the IP address at a destination. They can tell you're going to Google. They just can't read what you said. So uh, a VPN would fix that problem too. Another reason why you might, if you have a VPN, I can't even tell who you're talking to because first you go somewhere else and then you go with French out from there. So all I see is you're talking to a VPN provider and I have no idea who you're talking to. That would be the tunnel mode. That, and, then, and that's what you typically expect from VPN. It hides everything. People can't even tell who you're talking to. All they know is the total number of bytes that went in and out. They don't know anything about what it was or where it went. Yeah. Of course, if they can, unless the VPN provider can be hacked or pressured with a subpoena or something into handing it out. Absolutely. That's a very good question. And that's why a lot of people say, well, we have to escape the NSA, so let's send our data to Russia or China. And I'm like, dude, we need to talk about threat modeling. I mean, why are you so afraid of the NSA? I mean, even if you think the NSA is going to hurt you, just get used to it because there's nothing that could possibly stop them. So I, I, I Dr. Strange love, I would just relax and love the bomb. I mean, if you think you're hiding from the NSA, you just need to have your head examined. Just forget it. If the NSA wanted to squash you like a bug or the U.S. Army wanted to squash you like a bug, you would be squashed. I'm sorry. If you believe something else, you're wrong. <laughs> so just get over it and quit trying to hide from them. <laughs> that is not in your threat model. You can't possibly stop them. Your only hope is that you're not important enough for them to squash you like a bug. So don't plan horrible terrorism or something. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, this is amateurs have weird threat models. They're afraid of stuff that is the wrong stuff and they take the wrong countermeasures. Yeah. Yeah. It does everything. Yeah, it kept the whole packet and then it has to be, had another layer of addressing put outside. And the ESP encrypted the header. That's the entire packet, yeah, yeah. ESP encrypts, yeah, ESP encrypts the whole packet, including headers, yeah. There's test tunnel mode, transport mode, encrypts only the payload and leaves the addressing on the outside. So people can still tell where the data is relevant. These are choices, tunnel and transport. Good. All right, so um, internet key exchange here can use various algorithms to send the key for um, that. And PGP is the system developed by Phil Zimmerman. This was in his unbreakable, um, email, PG, uh, public key encrypted email. What's funny, I tried to do the same thing. In the late 80s, I, there was a very influential paper in the early 80s. In the 79, uh, the guy that wrote Mathematical Games in Scientific American, Martin Gardner, explained public key encryption. And I read that, and my whole generation of mathematically oriented programmers read it, and it was like wonderful. I said, this is fantastic. You can totally send secrets and nobody can ever get in them. And I said, I've got to program this right away. And I tried it. I had an eight bit processor and I tried to do hundred digit numbers in it and I couldn't get it working. So I failed. And it's a good thing because Phil Zimmerman had a 16 bit processor and he got it working. And so he distributed unbreakable RSA encryption for email and the NSA and the U S government came down on him like a load of bricks and said, you're giving secrets to our enemy and you need to be locked up, and he had to hire lawyers and run around and spend 10 years being harassed. I was incompetent enough to spare myself all that suffering. I would have done the same thing out of the same childish idealism that everybody should have privacy, and, but I wasn't competent enough to dig myself in that deep hole. They finally just gave up, but for about 10 years, they tormented the hell out of this poor guy for releasing on the public internet to our enemies could get it, encryption that the NSA couldn't get into. Anyway, 
Um, and the original model was to use the web of trust. He didn't trust the certificate authority, so he had this system I talk about where you would sign a key. In fact, um, I want to show you the, um, the key signing from XKCD. X, there's an XKCD for everything. Yeah, there you go, responsible behavior. XKCD is great. So here you go. This is uh, irresponsible behavior. And that's the, one of the fun things about KCD is you have to know technical things. If you, this, is, this is the problem. You trust that you know who this is because it's signed by a friend of a friend of a friend. This is the process which leads to that trust. Of course, how trustworthy is the process whereby you trust the official CAs who are taking bribes to hand over the private key and giving it to your corporate officer and the cops and everybody. You know, this is, when I was a kid, my dad used to walk by and watch me watching TV and he said, those people are all crooks. They're all ripping you off. And I said, dad, you're all cynical and bitter. And then I worked on the Federal Trade Commission fraud desk and holy crap, every single thing on TV would cross my desk five years later as the lose weight without dieting and magic motor oil and everything. These poor slobs would get 5% of their money back four years later. And I said, Dad was right. Everybody is just a crook. <laughs> but you know, it's that's the that like I said, the problem is who you trust, and that is in fact a real problem. And no amount of math or technology really spares you from the painful problem that you are trusting a lot of people and they're not really all that trustworthy. Anyway, so SMIME is another system for to encrypt email extensions, and there's another one, um, MIME and S MIME is the encryption, MIME is the protocol to move email attachments by encoding them as ASCII, like Base64, and SMIME is the encrypting key to encrypt email attachments. And I can mention, this is the one I mentioned before, there's escrowed encryption. You could give someone else your encryption key. You could give two people half of your key, or maybe you would like to give the government all your private keys because they passed a law requiring it, and there have been many serious attempts to do that that got so far, that, like I say, Microsoft built that a property into their systems. You can do that. You can specify in your Microsoft products where to send a private copy of all the keys to because people really thought that was going to happen a while ago. And if there were a few more big terrorist attacks, I bet it would happen. Anyway. What would happen with systems that were? They would, they would have a law saying you must use system, for example, phone telephone calls, they have Kalia. You cannot have a telephone company that does not let the cops wiretap it. You buy a law. If they come to you with a wiretap order, you must let them hear the call. So you could not implement end-to-end -end encryption where you don't have the key. It would be illegal to do so. You must have a way for them to tap into it. And the large portion of law enforcement community feels like the same thing should be true of the internet. If I come to you with a court order, you should be able to hand over the data. Don't tell me you encrypt, like Apple encrypted their phone to where even they can't get in. I still don't understand that. What do we do if you forget your pin? Everybody, since the dawn of time, said, of course, the manufacturer has a back door. I go to them, and they have a way to get in. Apple's the first company. I know. Apple's the first company to lock themselves out of their own phone. So if I forget my pin, I have to just throw it away? What yeah. the hell? So how, how can this early company broke in? Of course. The problem is they make mistakes like everybody else, and the Israelis totally get in. So Celebrite can just blast right through. So Apple tried to lock everybody out. And wouldn't even let the FBI in. Yeah, okay. So the result is the FBI just paid hackers to hack in, and now they can get in all they want. So this is what happens when your doctor know. If you make your security rules ridiculous, people would just break them. So if Apple thought they were in control who got in there, they should have let some people in. By not letting anybody in, they went in the back door. Now they can get in all the phones right, anytime. Uh, yeah, if you if you hold too tight, quiet, yeah. The old system before this, six years ago, Apple had a system. You could just take any phone, you'd attach a court order, you would mail it to Apple, would pay them $300, and they would copy all the data unencrypted onto a hard drive and send it back to you. The cops did it all the time. It was the standard forensic procedure. Everybody knew they had a back door. They could get in. They didn't want you to have the back door. You'd just send it to them, and they would do it for you, and everybody was fine with that. And then they changed it so they can't get in. The FBI said, wait, why did you do that? What is the benefit of this? This is not protecting your customers. This is not 
doing any good? What, why did you have to make it impossible to ever get in? Why couldn't you just go back to your old system where you have some way to do it in the factory, but nobody else has it? That was working fine. And I, you know, I, it's not the current popular opinion, but I think the FBI is more or less right. I really don't know what the hell Apple did that for. And I don't know how their tech support department can tolerate this, but so far they're doing it. But other people are not scrambling to do the same thing. It's kind of nuts. Why would you lock yourself out of your own stuff? Um, yeah. Someone holds the password. There's at least one person, as you know. Somebody has to hold the password. Well, your Bitcoin, you have a private key for your coins. And if you lose it, your coins are gone forever. Right. So you have the same problem. There's a private key, and now you have to handle that key. Right. If somebody steals that key, they get your coins. And if you lose that key, you lose your coins. Yeah. So say you're in charge now. Yeah. Now you've gone broke. Yeah. You, if you steal all the money and not let anybody else in it. Well, no, because that's the problem. If you use a broker to buy the coins and they hold the key then they can totally steal your money but you don't have to do it that way that's how most people do it because they don't understand it and then the broker just steals your money and leaves but if you do it right you could like mine bitcoins on your own computer keep the private key not tell anybody and nobody can steal them except of course by hacking your computer and stealing but the middlemen don't have the key so they can't steal your coins that that in that effect the system works I know, I know. So that's the problem. What I'm trying to say is, yeah. a lot of people have lost their money. Right? Of course, that's why a lot of people say, "Gee, Bitcoin went up so much, I would have got rich if I bought Bitcoin." And the answer is a good book out of this called "The Forty Foot Blockchain" from David Gerard. And he says, "No, if you had gotten in Bitcoin from the beginning, you would have lost all your money at Mount Gox. That is what really happened. Seven percent of all the Bitcoins in the world were stolen in that one place. That is how normal people got Bitcoins. A small number of nerds." in the mailing list, mine Bitcoins in the early days as a mathematical curiosity. But by the time anybody heard of it, the only way to get it was to buy them from Mt. Gox and Mt. Gox stole all the money. So you would not be rich if you bought Bitcoin at the beginning. You would have just got screwed earlier. <laughs> anyway, um, that's why my friends came to me and said, should I buy Bitcoin? And I said, no, because I worked on the pyramid scheme for the FTC as a contractor. That was my, I did nothing but pyramid schemes for years. And I took one look at cryptocurrency and I said, no. This is just a pyramid scheme, which is, by the way, what it is. There's no actual product. This is bullshit. You can't, there is no value in the thing. There has to be some kind of product or the money doesn't have any real value. This is an old fashioned idea and I'm sticking to it. Anyway, um, so you can have, um, you can give law enforcement a copy of the key and some nations require it, although not yet the US and you might uh, back it up by handing parts of it to people. The clipper chip is one of the big scandals. The U.S. government um, announced this would be the standard. It did DES encryption. Everybody would put it in there. You may remember they wanted to do this to televisions. They wanted to put a V-chip in all the televisions to block all the forbidden television shows that had violence in them. And they went really far. And I think they managed to stop that before it became the standard. But they were going to make it by law required to have a V-chip in every television. Britain's doing this right now. Britain announced, and it took effect a few months ago, total block of all porn. And so everybody, every ISP has to block porn. And if you want them to unblock the porn, you have to make a request and verify your identity to, to your ISP, which will be recorded. And the government didn't take that. So they have third party providers that are supposed to take some driver's license or something and verify your identity, maintain the database. And they couldn't find anybody to do that. And everybody screamed bloody murder. Wait a minute, all our private data is gonna be held by some bizarre third company that's not even the government. So now it has been temporarily delayed again. But it's in the law that sometime this year, after delays over, they're supposed to block all the porn in Britain and have a verified list of all the perverts that wanted the porn being held by somebody and maintained by somebody in some unspecified way. Yes, everybody could just use a VPN, obviously. And I would sure do that before I would put myself on some list. <laughs> And you know, the, the Prime Minister of Australia about eight years ago, he announced, I'm going to put a firewall around Australia and I'm going to block all the porn and all the viruses and all the spam and make the internet safe again. And he got millions of dollars and he announced a government program and all the technology people said, you know, uh, there's nothing you can buy that will do that. I'm sorry. A lot of people would actually like that, but you can't do that. And he said, we'll do it. And so some company actually took the contract and took the money and built some firewall, which totally did not do it. And they spent years being humiliated. They tried. We found it, you know, 
oh, gee, what a surprise. We were unable to do that. There is, a lot of people would like that, but there is nothing you can buy that will do that. <laughs> anyway, um, this is the problem. Like I say, this is a TISP, this is right in the point. The government leaders want things which seem reasonable to them, and they're impossible technically, and they don't get enough communication to get good advice from the technical people and understand what the problem is. So they keep making stupid rules that make them look ridiculous, but they're trying to do a good job a lot of them. They, they want to catch the criminals and the terrorists. They want to stop people that are getting malware on the internet. This is not a bad thing. And tech, I think technical people should be cooperating with the government to help them accomplish these good things without destroying everything in the process. Anyway, I think I'll just stop here. I think we're late enough and uh, we can finish it up tomorrow. That's massive censorship. It is, of course. It is. Of course. And so there are different attitudes. The prevailing attitude in the security community is that we should just not let the government spy on anything or get in everything and everything should be totally encrypted. They should be locked out of everything. And there's the fascists like me. My opinion is, you know, the government has some legitimate needs to get at stuff. So if you try to lock them out completely, they will just hack in like the FBI did. You, you have a choice to either have the government ram something down your throat that has not been designed by a technician or to make a reasonable compromise with them and have some way for them to get something. And then you had some control. But a lot of the prevailing belief of the majority, which seems to be the left side of the technical community, seems to be, no, no, we're, we can use our technical lock everyone out completely 100% and they'll never get in. And I think that's stupid. There is a way in. There's a bunch of ways in. Like Bruce Schneier was on stage. There's a special conference just because of Snowden. The Europeans got so mad, they went had a special conference run by Mieko Hyponen just to discuss this topic called Trust Econ. And it was all about how horrible the government is. And I got a special t-shirt that said token fascist. And I went to that conference because I was the only pro-government side there. And they had Bruce Schneier on stage. And they asked him, what do you think of this? And he said, well, you know, I think the, uh, the NSA did about the right thing. They wanted nobody but us, and they poisoned the random number generators. They can predict the random numbers. He said, if you wanted to have a NOBA system, that is the best way to do it, because you can't figure it out from the outside. It looks fine. Nobody else is going to get in, and they'll get in. And he said, you know, there's another attack they have called a court order. They can just come to your business with lawyers and demand to see your stuff, and they can see it. So there's no escaping government oversight. He said, what are you talking about? You, they can see your stuff. You cannot stop them with any technology. And what do you want? Would you rather be overseen by China or Russia or something? I mean, the U.S. is relatively benign, and you should just accept that the government is looking at your stuff and making sure you're obeying the law, and, and they're coming with search warrants and cops and financial disclosure requirements and audit requirements, and that's okay. And he said, why are you trying to hide everything 100% from everybody? That is just not achievable and not even sensible. But that is the current um, popular belief. I know. Very much. And what they think, what it is, is, is they're going to, once they find out that I've done something wrong, they're going to use that when they want something and they will sue me. And no. that's why they don't want them. Yeah, and I'm going to really stop the share, I think. Weird, but keep going. Um, yeah. I know. I mean, this has always puzzled me ever since I was a kid. Everybody hates the cops and everybody hates the 